Welcome to Roots and Ruminants, your podcast for creative and innovative use of farm, pasture, and rangeland. We're going back to the basics of raising and grazing livestock, growing your own forage, and practical land use. Well, welcome. Joining us here, we are live in Caputa, South Dakota. Sean Freeland is our guest here today. Uh, we are here at the, the ranch, which also doubles as a cover crop, maize, pumpkin patch, fall extravaganza, direct uh, beef sales business, and as I recently learned, free range wild turkey operation. Yeah. Is that sum it up a little bit that's pretty close we also have uh you know there's white tailed deer and mule deer extravaganza along with some grouse and pasture pork pasture, pasture pork pasture pork. we missed them are yeah. they outside right now no, they're in there oh, for, oh in the freezer. freezer they're in the freezer <laughs> awesome yep. yeah we're here in, in january so i guess that makes sense it's a seasonal thing yeah, yeah. good good awesome. yeah so we're excited to be here with sean and Sean has has been a, you know just a great promoter and user of not only Cover Cross but Soil Health World, and uh, certainly been a mentor for other people to follow. And uh, we're going to talk through kind of his journey today, um, his willingness and eagerness to change, try new things, adapt, and be flexible as these things come to him. So uh, to get there, though, let's hear where you started because it seems like everybody's paths have to have to get to a point where they need to change. So let's hear how you did start. If you got to a point you needed to change or it was just a willingness or wanted to do that. Right. So there's a few things that, that brought on change, I'd say. Um, we, we bought this ranch in 2004, in October 2004, and we're just excited to be here and looked around and saw, you know, kind of what our neighbors were doing and just this different operations up and down the countryside in our area and, tried to kind of mimic what they were doing. Um, I think when we moved here, we were calving probably in late February and March. Um, then we moved it back into January and February and we're running everything through a barn. Um, but, and we've got some irrigated ground here. So we, we were able to put up a lot of forage and feed through all of those things, you know, um, takes a little extra feed to calve that early. So there's, you know, several things that, prompted the change and one of the deals was haying on irrigated ground um you tend to get a ton of gophers in irrigation and alfalfa hmm. and the gopher gophers was a problem for a sycamore so i'm mowing away and looking on my phone for new windrowers and i see they're two hundred thousand dollars and i i just couldn't grasp that so i just kept thinking there's got to be a different way it's got to be a better way to do this and so uh, that kind of moved me to go to the South Dakota Grasslands Coalition to their grazing school and learn. And I just kept asking at that school, you know, people around, I said, is there anybody grazing pivots profitably? Is, can, you, can I do that? Because to me it was, I couldn't find the information on it. And it was like jumping off a cliff. And so the last day I did find somebody got some information and did some research and then you know, just one thing kind of led to another, and um, 2016, we were dry, and so we were kind of stuck with even half either feeding through the drought or destocking and maybe starting to see if we could graze this irrigation. So we had triticale planted and decided to graze that, and that worked out pretty good. We set paddocks up and grazed our about 200 yearlings through there, and that worked out pretty good, and then... We terminated that triticale with the cows and planted a full season cover crop in there. And then we wintered on that. And that's where the change started, I think. Great. So we were, uh, so <laughs> Sean and I uh, were in a, a program called South Dakota Ag and Rural Leadership uh, back around that time or a little bit earlier, been about five, six years ago now. A uh, great program brings about 30 different people from the state of South Dakota, kind of in the middle of their careers uh, for a learning and uh, traveling experience. Um, end up getting gone about 35, 40 nights throughout the year, so uh, the two-year program. So uh, get to know each other quite well. And I remember it was about that time, Sean, there was a lot of, had a lot of questions and conversations kind of in through that process and exposure to, to more people there too. Right, yeah, and that was, that was an awesome experience for me, it, uh, just to see different operations and, and visit with guys that were doing things at a higher level um, than I was or that I could find in my area. Um, 
so that was a great experience. But it also, I brought a lot of that home and tried to make it, you know, just conventional but bigger. And so I was always looking outside of our place. I was always looking at the neighbors and wanting to expand and get more cows and more land. And it turned into a debt spiral, really. I mean, it just we just kept adding money and more money to it. And um, I put my family at tremendous risk doing what I did. And it worked out. It did work out. Um, but it was, you know, I don't think it was sustainable what we were doing. Why does it seem that, I mean, this is, uh, that's not uncommon that in your area or region, you look to your peers, you look to your neighbors and farmers to see how they're doing it. And you think that you need to do it that way. When you have no idea if they're actually making it work, I mean, if it's successful or not, but you think that's the way to do it. And I think it, it does take exposure to other things, um, other areas, other new ideas to almost break that mold just a little bit. And it can be right, but it may not be right for you. Right. One of the things that, you know, Jared mentioned, we were in Sodaro together. And uh, one of the things that that did for me was give me permission to leave. It, and I wouldn't have done that if it wouldn't have been for Sodaro. I would have stayed here and kept doing the same things. But it did give me permission to leave. And even though maybe some of the things that I learned didn't fit, that I brought back didn't fit on our place, I just kept, I knew that I could leave now. And before, I just would never have took the time to leave. But now, you know, I'll if there's something I want to learn, I just leave. And I go I go to a workshop for a weekend or a couple of days, or I might just go visit somebody's place. But yeah. it did give me permission to leave, and it's that's helped me grow. Have you always been a learner, or did that kind of trigger it to get you going to want to always learn? No, I think I'd always been a learner. Um, I always think I can do it. If you can do it, I can do it better kind of an attitude. Yeah. Um, so I've always been a learner and always strive to do whatever I do. I want to be good at it. And then I have a tendency to move on to the next thing. But I just adapt and roll with it, I think. Mm -hmm. So from what I was, um, from your, kind of what you said about your management of your cows prior back in 2016, looking at the the cow as, the, as a factor here on the ranch and kind of listening to a lot of advice that you can find, which says get the most out of that factory, right? So calve earlier, uh, breed up high, highest performance bulls you can. I mean, do all those things. And obviously that, that mentality has shift. And so what is, the, what is the expectation of a cow here at the ranch today, and how is it different from what it would have been six, seven years ago? Well, she needs to be structurally sound. Um, if, if she doesn't look right, if she's got bad udders or bad feet, she doesn't make it here. But other than that, right now, if you bring home a calf and breed up and bring home a calf and breed up and bring home a calf, you get to stick around. Um, if that doesn't happen, they're gone. They're just gone. And we've put some tremendous stress on our cows um, in the last five years since we've kind of destocked and um, regrouped and kind of changed what we were doing. We're just making them they got to work they got to do it for us or we're just not going to keep them so mother nature has a she's got a really good shot at culling them for us and um i don't know some of our cows don't look great but we still have calves on them we'll probably wean in another 60 days or so we'll probably wean and they some of them look tough and it was a tough summer here we had six inches of rain until that october it kind of we got another four inches but still 10 inches of rain this year and six inches last year. Dams were dry. Water is bad. The cows look rough, but I can't tell you what a good cow is, but I think mother nature can. So if they bring back a decent calf and they're holding up structurally and, you know, keep breeding, keep breeding back, that's what we're keeping for now. I think down the road we'll be able to hone it in and, you know, hopefully get cows that are maybe fly resistant and, bringing back, you know, bigger calves, but I've totally changed how I think about a cow. So let's walk through that life cycle here. So you said you'd be, you know, weaning after a while here. So when's the, when's the calving date, the calving window, when does weaning happen? What's the marketing expectation of the calves? Like walk us through that life cycle if you would. Okay. So we, we started about the 5th of May, we'll start calving. Um, and then usually the middle of June, 
we're done. And the calves, we leave with the cows until March if we can. Sometimes it doesn't work out. Um, we'll wait them a little earlier. But um, the goal is to make make them make the, that kind of make them mother cow teach the calf. So we want them to learning to go out and grub and hunt and find the things that are going to make them thrive in our environment. So we. Uh, we're shooting for a 10-month weaning deal, and then we'll keep those calves as yearlings, and the goal is to make grass-finished beef out of them. Um, we've been dry the last two years, and we just can't hold on to them. We're just we're running out of pasture, so we haven't been able to hold on to as many as we'd like. But the ones we do, they do make it to the grass-finished beef uh, program. And then, um, yeah, that's kind of the life cycle. It, and we haven't been able to get that down as short a window as we'd like that's taken you know we, our goal is about 28 months to have them ready for butcher but it just hasn't we haven't made that yet are you doing that mostly on steers and heifers both or on steers primarily i love heifers um steers steers seem like they take a little longer the heifers they you can get them pretty fat in a hurry so yeah we'll do it with both of them heifers if they they get a shorter window we'll leave the bulls with them for 30 days and whatever doesn't go you know whatever isn't bred i'm happy because mm-hmm. they they bring just as much or more as the grass finished beef i think one of the things so we drove through <clears throat> the cows at least coming up got to see them they look they look great I mean, they're haired up good condition things look nice i think the the question that most people have is, you know i mean it's it's a different it's a different way of raising your cows is having your calves on through the winter so if you're doing that and you're not feeding these, I'm assuming, right, because they're out and they're grazing and the calves are with them, how do you keep that cow in condition during the winter? I mean, it's been cold and windy and I mean, it's a tough environment. Well, the good ones bubble up and then the bad ones don't. And then, you know, if it, we're not going to let them die. So yeah. if they get so, you know, pulled down that we got to do something different, then we'll do something different. But it, this time of year when it's, rough and it's pretty easy to see which ones are going to make it which ones aren't and then if maybe they get pulled down so much they don't breed back and then they're cold so and it's you can really see it in the new generations coming up like our heifers you can really see it the the heifers that are grazing our cover crop right now were fed last december with the cows we did some bale grazing um and they were 70 miles from home and we just don't worry about them. They're, you know, they're, it's the middle of winter and they're 70 miles from home bale grazing. And as long as I know I've got open water, I'm not worried about them. But we weaned those in December, brought them home, dumped them on a cover crop. And then we had a, a cool season cover crop we planted this spring and they grazed that. Then they went to pasture for a while. And now they're on a full season cover crop for, you know, stockpile for the winter. So they've never really experienced a true feeding, you know, so, and they look, they look really good. I'm they really do. happy with how they it's look going. awesome. So what do you think this, I mean, as far as feed value of this cover crop, where do you think it is right now as far as crop, crop protein? And You know, I don't I don't even know. I, I tried to figure out how to test it. So I was doing the nut ball test for a while. And that would, you know, on a, on a pregnant cow, we were looking for a third of a pound to gain a day-ish. And they were gaining about a pound and a half a day. So they were getting fat on the cover crop. So now I just go out and I, I do a lot of walking around out there just to make sure that they're leaving enough cover and or maybe we're moving electric fence here or there or whatever, but I just watch their manure. So if their manure starts piling up, I know they're lacking protein. If it's got a nice pat and a little dimple in the middle of it, um, it's usually a little bit more of a red color. I know that they're doing all right then. And, you know, they, they, they'll tell you too when it starts getting... Usually a couple of days before it starts getting a little tougher, they, they'll start walking the fence and mm-hmm. yeah. they're ready to move. Yep. You said one of the drivers to to get you to think about possibly changing or doing something different was realizing the that you need $200,000 to upgrade into a nice wind rower. Uh, how has your machinery lineup and, and the number of machines that you keep operational changed over the years here as you've started using your pivots for, for grazing instead of for cropping? Yeah, that's a great question. So <laughs> it's kind of fun. It's kind of comical because we have things around that 
we still have we still have two tractors. We had one for bailing, one for raking, kind of, and one for pulling a feed wagon, and one for loading a feed wagon. And um, we've always had, uh, I wouldn't say always, but you know, we've always kind of had two tractors around, one for kind of for feeding and feed wagons and and haying. Um, so now I've got one tractor just sitting around and we're thinking, what do we need to do? We should do something. I'm looking at maybe a tow handler. I don't know. I don't know if I really want to, I mean, we would just sell it and use that money for something else. But, um, feed wagons are gone. We used to have a little feed lot set up. Uh, feed bunks were sold. Um, I used to feed cows in bunks. I had some big portable bottomless bunks. Those are all gone. Um, they were just, I don't know, turn around, rakes are gone, baler's gone, all of that equipment, you just look around and it's sitting there and you think you're going to use it, but you just never, you just don't. And it, it just gets easier and easier. One of the, one of the things also, I guess, when we, that decided that was kind of our decision making on change, we were looking at an aerial map of our place and come up with about 60 acres that were blowing dirt because there were kind of lots around our place that we'd, you know, traditionally either calved in or fed in or whatever. And you think of those as sacrifice acres, but then I got to thinking, you know, when I grew up, we didn't have any land. And my dad, when I was probably 10 or 12 years old, picked up, I don't remember, 10, 15 acres. And it was like every man's dream, you know, to have 10 or 15 acres. And I said to Christy, I said, a 40 year old man would kill to have 60 acres of ground to do something with. And we're just watching it blow in the winter. That's and so cool. now our goal is to have that covered up with grass and it's, it's working, it's happening. Hmm. That is powerful. That's good, good stuff. How would you, so, I mean, you've, you are very involved with soil health coalition, the grassland coalition. So, you know, we, we drove across the state today. Um, you know, when we left the Brookings area, it was, five degrees and we had a 25 mile an hour south wind and we've got i don't know eight inches of snow which is probably the lowest amount that we've had in most january's and it's it's warmer it's a little well, it's certainly drier to the person that says well i can't do it here because of this it's, it's too hard of winter it's the, the the cropland is too valuable you've seen other people do it in other parts of the world how do you justify that to them or how do you i mean what's your response to that i think it just depends on what you want to do I mean, what, are, what is your goals? If you want to do it, you can do it. Just figure it out. There's those, those five main principles of soil health apply everywhere. And to me, you know, if you're lacking moisture, keep it covered. And you keep that soil covered up with armor and um, you can hold the moisture. I, I, our NRCS guy was out here oh, a month ago or so and was doing some soil so health assessment training for some other NRCS employees and did some infiltration stuff and said, he said, you can infiltrate 60 inches an hour. And I missed most of the training. I just walked out there to see what they were doing. But he, he stood up, he said, well, this is the only place I've ever checked off all the boxes on the soil health assessment. Mm. He said, you're, you're able to infiltrate 60 inches an hour here. If you think about that, you know, we've got, 16 inches of rain in the last two years and I'm able to store that. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of figuring out what you want to do and then go after it. Yeah. You know? You're probably thinking, wow, we are really, really dry or my soil is pretty good. Yeah. 60 <laughs> inches in an hour. Yeah. It's, it's almost impossible. Like we kind of started out the conversation. It's almost impossible not to, to look at what you're doing and compare right to, to other people. And, and sometimes that, comparison can lead to positive things and sometimes it can lead you to you know basically trying to achieve goals for yourself that really don't make sense or weren't the target so i'm assuming in this process just with this refocus and and you know taking out most all the inputs you had before you probably have less cows on the place than you did back when you were you know high input uh and doing all those things but a lot of times in ranching, we kind of like, it's kind of a mark of success, right? You can't ask somebody, but everybody kind of knows how many cows everybody has. So tell us about coping with and, and what it feels like to be comfortable and happy with less cows. Right. That's, a, that's another good question. So it, that was one of our, uh, my goals is to have 600 cows, but it was a goal. It had nothing to do with my life or my family or anything else. It was just a goal. Well, 
is it, you know, can I lift 500 pounds? Is that a goal? <laughs> right. So, so Christy was, oh, she's always been a lot wiser than me. So she would say, well, why, why do you want 600 cows? Well, we got to have, you know, got to have them or the neighbors are going to buy us up if we don't, you know, if we don't get big enough. Well, so we just figured out that if we ran, you know, we run, like you said, we're substantially less cows, but we figured out that we run less cows and maybe sell them through a different market and get twice as much money. We could run half as many cows and not have the equipment and all the maintenance and work and, you know, family life is better. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Gosh, toughest question of the day. Why do wives ask better questions? Man. Good job. <laughs> Christy's standing here listening to <laughs> us, so kudos to her. Yep. <laughs> I think that's, maybe it is just from the outside looking in. And, and, and especially from a spouse, uh, able to see some of these stressors and able to question things, right? Like ultimately your wife and my wife would be the same way. Like she knows what's going to stress me or, you know, really get me rolling. And, and ultimately, you know, with a family too, you want to spend more time with them and be involved with those activities. So yeah, I don't know. I, I think that's probably just a a production agriculture paradigm shift as well that needs to change. Bigger is not always better. Definitely not always profitable. Well, I think the go- I mean, everybody wants to have a, like a reasonably good level of income, right? And I mean, everybody wants to be kind of secure and also, you know, live in a nicest house, right? You know, and have nicest vehicles, those kind of things. What we're not used to in agriculture is almost being able to achieve it if we're not like the biggest in the county. There, there's and I've mentioned this and some people will push back on it and it's not universal, but for the most part, there's, there's more prosperity in rural America than there was at any time that I can remember it, you know, thinking of growing up and things like that. And I don't know if we've really prepped ourselves to how to deal with that, to reset the goals from a survivalist mode of, I got to grow, I got to grow, I got to grow to maybe, maybe I don't need to, maybe I don't have to, maybe I can, you know, look inward more and, drive value from that and not have to, you know, outcompete everybody. Yeah, you can still grow, but maybe not out. And that's right. kind of what we're starting to do a little bit with the, you mentioned the pumpkin patch and the maze and um, yeah, you can, we're starting to try to grow up that, with the pasture pork. These are just things that when you're not going, you know, I don't know if you say balls to the walls, but if you're not going great guns, Um, all the time you have time to think about other stuff Mm -hmm. and then you have time to plan it and then you have time to get your family involved in it. If you're sitting at your kids, this is, this is another thing that bothers me about what we were, about what I was doing is I would go to my kids functions and be irritated that I was there because I knew (laughs) I had other things I could be doing. And if you're doing that and not enjoying your family, there's definitely something wrong. Great comment. How do you, do you want to go? No, you and Christy have two daughters. The daughters, um, I know are involved in several of the, the enterprises here. One has a, has a growing sheep enterprise that we're, we're helping out with a little bit here on this trip today and then, uh, pasture pigs and tell us about the involvement of the rest of your family in the operation. Yep. So two girls, Riley and Ryan, um, 19 and 17 years old now. Um, and I, I feel like I kind of missed the boat on on you know getting them involved i'm a little nervous that they won't come back because i you know i changed too late but um they are starting to like you said we, one day we sat down and said okay you guys come up with an enterprise on our place that doesn't include the cattle and my youngest she didn't skip a beat and said i'll take the honey <laughs> she had not, to do, not much to sell in the honey, but <laughs> I'll call. Easy. I'll call an apiary. Let them put boxes there for the summer. <laughs> yeah. They'll come pick them back up and drop a box of honey off. Exactly. That's so that's South Dakota honey production. Yep. Exactly how that works for her. <laughs> so, smart. but they are that you know the pasture pork. That's a pretty lucrative little gig for you know a seventeen year old. It's not. It's not hard to go out and move one wire and move you know twenty thirty pigs around through the summer. And, you know, feed them a little here and there. It's not a, it's not too tough. And it's an easy sale. They, you, I mean, everybody wants a pasture pig. And if they've had it once, they're hooked. They're, they're back again. So, um, yeah, she's into that. My oldest daughter, Riley, she's, she's been wanting sheep for years. And, of course, I was conventional and it was a cow's only ranch. So there was no sheep allowed. And now I see the benefits of sheep and I see that uh, they could be doing good things for us and probably make the cows more profitable so 
So the sheep story, how the sheep came about uh, to be here out in Caputa was uh, we were, uh, you and Christy were back in my part of the world uh, for a bull sale of a mutual friend of ours. And I was supposed to be helping at the bull sale, but uh, my wife and I were having, having COVID at the time. Uh, and, uh, and so you guys wanted to come visit. It was like, ah, oh, we can't visit. We got COVID. And they're like, ah, oh, we'll just, we'll just sit outside and have coffee and six, six feet away. So <laughs> you guys came over to our porch and we were having coffee. And, uh, I, I don't think we ended up giving you COVID at that time. Okay, good. You're just double checking that. And, uh, we were talking about sheep and stuff. We had some bottle lambs and anyway, long story short, they ended up heading back, uh, in their vehicle with a, a dog carrier with two bottle lambs and a Tupperware full of milk replacer to head back. Yeah, two two sheep ah. and a CRV. Ah. Ah. <laughs> so, and we, uh, Katie and I, were both planning this as well because we could have very easily sent Weathers um, out of the uh, bottle lamb. Is like, no, we're going to send you lambs because I bet this doesn't stop here. So, <laughs> then the second part of the story is Sean was coming east for a Soul Health Coalition um, event and uh, showed up in a horse trailer that was going to pick up calves on the way back with a couple sheep. And now they're three cycles exposed to actually Justin's ram. Oh, man, this is a circle. It's really tied in. Oh, my goodness. It's it all together. In. Wow. And now they're they're back home. They're back home. Well, they're not quite yet. They're still in the topper. <laughs> but pretty soon we'll let them out. It's tough. Yep. Good sheep. Yep. So tell us about the... Uh, last summer or the summer before when I was out looking at the pasture pig operation, uh, the ranch is situated right here on Rapid Creek, and uh, there's there's some trees on your property right along the creek and that kind of stuff and on underbrush. Tell us about, I know that's where the pigs were. Tell us about the transition that you saw on the, on the land, uh, bring the pigs around. Yeah, so they, I don't know anything about pigs. I just figured that they were going to need some shade, so um, we didn't have any shelter or anything like that, just have a couple little calf hutches that we move around with them but um so we wanted them in the shade so we put them on the creek and uh you know in some cottonwood trees and a few years ago we had lots of flooding so there's lots of down trash and timber and just garbage in those trees and those pigs rooted that all up moved it around got contact with the soil and all that stuff is breaking down now and then in the spring we we kind of moved cows through there quick in those same areas and that's where they want to be. The cows want to be where the pigs were. Um, this year, we've seen the same thing. We put uh, we put we started the pigs in a a spot that was traditionally, you know, fed on heavily, and it always just grew marsh elder seven feet tall. And we put the pigs there, and it's lush green grass right now. It is amazing, and I don't know if it, you know I don't know what we did there, it, what we changed, if it just was timing or what, but. It's pretty cool. So we like to put the pigs um, somewhere where they can disturb something um, where the cows aren't. And then hopefully we're building grass and soil from there. Let's talk through the, the science of that or like the agronomic uh, chemistry, if you will, of what's happening there. Okay. The first thing that comes to my mind is, uh, you know, no till in fields is bad, right? We don't want to disturb the soil. However, if we could put pigs out on a pasture, an area that's, you know, we, we want to change, well, now the pigs are doing some cool things to it. So what's going on? How are those two things simultaneously happening? No. Why is one okay and one is not? Yeah, like why, why are we having disturbance and regeneration at the same time? Yes. I mean, I mean those are the two things. That's not yes. Yeah. How is that happening? Two good words. Yeah. Well, I think we're like, adding biology to the soil as we're doing disturbance at the same time is, is one of the, the things about it, right? And like you said, you're only using them in areas that, that need disturbance, that need something, that have some, some issues and things wrong with them anyway. I don't probably don't want to get 17,000 pigs and run them on the native gra- warm season grass up on the hilltops, you know, and have that same level of disturbance. Might not go, might not go as well. Yep, and the disturbance they're doing is small. We move them before they really get you know, when they run out of feed is when they really start rutting. And uh, so we we try to keep in front of that. It looks like they're, they'll they'll rut through, you know, we just run one wire about a foot off the ground. And if they start flipping dirt up on top of that, we, ah. we're way behind. Okay. We should have moved them before that. And we get caught sometimes where we don't move them. This fall, it worked out really good where they were at. We would take a hay ride through there and kids would throw some of the rotten pumpkins to the pigs. And it worked out good um, just to have them where they're at so we didn't move them. And they, they probably did more disturbance there than I would like. But we'll see what it, you know, we'll see what it 
turns out to be. Um, is it like a zoo that you have to pay for a rotten pumpkin to then feed to the pigs? That's in my mind, but yes. it hasn't been. <laughs> we could sell these rotten pumpkins for four bucks. <laughs> right. And they'll feed them to my pigs. <laughs> yep. Oh, it's an extra $4 to feed it to them. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for doing chores, kids. Yep. Have a good day. Yep. It could be. We haven't been there. You know, one of our goals, is, one of the reasons I got into Sodaro was uh, at Storm Atlas out here. The You know, the blizzard was... It was a huge catastrophe for us. We weren't sure, you know, what the heck was going to happen with our operation. But the news stories that were coming out of our own community were just frustrating. Um, the disconnect from people in Rapid City that I always considered, you know, rural and western and figured every rancher knew somebody in town, everybody in town knew a rancher. And just the, the things that were being said were frustrating. And so that kind of drove me to to go uh, go through the Sodaro course and try to get a better voice and never have that disconnect again. And so that's one of our goals. That's one of the reasons we want people out here to show them livestock and, and have – that's the corn maze or the, the cover crop maze that we have is that's just a draw to bring people out and try to teach them about agriculture. And um, but it was kind of a mistake this year that we figured out the hayride is that's where I need to be because I enjoy talking about it. <laughs> And those people really, I think they they really enjoy listening. Yeah. There's just the simple things like a windbreak that, you know, one time we stopped and stopped the tractor and happened to be by a windbreak. And the young young man says, why did you build a wall here? And, uh, you know, then when you got a well, light bulb goes on and you have an opportunity to explain what a windbreak, you know, why it's there, why it's shaped in a V, why it's shaped, you know, facing the northwest. That's where our storms come from. And. People don't know that. Right. No, I think it's awesome. I think it's, it's fantastic. I know it kind of develops, uh, takes a different little bit of a theme every year. It's kind of, you know, grown and evolved a little bit, the whole um, fall experience here out here in Computa. Uh, tell us a little bit about the direct beef sales. When did that start and how's that look? And also for our audience, how can they buy? Yeah. Um, so we've always sold direct beef. We used to, you know, feed corn and used to, Direct market about fifty head a year, um, just corn fed beef, and then um, I can't even tell you what, why we changed. I think it was just the the doors that had opened through soil health, and the more knowledge I learned, I just started to see that the cows were more of a tool to use to heal the land, and and we didn't want that bare soil anymore, so we just switched. Um, but. Yeah, so we we've been selling for quite a while. We've kind of we're kind of rebuilding our market with the with the grass finished beef. Um, I'm really adamant that it should be a good eating experience. If we're not doing it just to say we have grass finished beef, it should still marble. Um, it should still have fat on it, and so that's we're really picky on the ones that will sell. As you know, if you're going to buy a, a ribeye, it should have some marbling in it, and. That's and that's the benefit of grass finished beef. The fat is where the nutrients are. So, um, trying to get that market and to get that explained to people um, and teach them that has been. I'm not a marketer, but so anyway, that's where we're at. We do have a we. If you can buy it, you can come to the place and buy it. You can buy it at uh, Breadrit Grocery Store in Rapid. You can buy it. We have an online store. You can order from. Um, we sell. Quarters, halves, and holes. We sell retail. Christy has a subscription service. And you can do uh, eight-pound boxes a month um, if you want to go that route. But, yeah, hopefully pork and lamb in the future. I mean, we sell the pigs. have been going like hotcakes as holes and halves. We haven't even had a chance to sell that retail yet. But And honey. And honey. We got yeah. honey. honey. So all these Pumpkins. different enterprises. Pumpkins. Yeah, rotten pumpkin. <laughs> the rotten pumpkin feed. All these different enterprises it takes some different skill sets, and and how is how are you willing to do that? You know, I mean, what motivates you to I don't know keep trying different things and be innovative and adapt? I guess is maybe the word. Um, I just have more time. I think I think we just have more time to think about things and well, wow, this would our place is really. 12 miles from Rapid City, this is a good spot to do this. Mm, mm -hmm. um, and then you get 
you just get more time to look around your place and you know i haven't had a cow in this spot for you know we have we've got some old crick channels are full of cattails and things that we just don't use the deer use them a little bit but the pigs had a heyday in there the, you know, rutting up cattail tubers and chewing on those. Um, <laughs> so I don't know that, and I, I don't have the skills. I just go learn them. If if there's a, a, something different I want to do, I, I usually just go look for it, how to do it. I have a, I have a different off the wall question. How do you herd the pigs? I mean, this is big open country, and you're not really. You, you mentioned hot wire, but how do you move them? Do you call them? Yeah, you can call them. So um, we, yeah, they they'll come pretty easy, but you just. <laughs> We just kind of leapfrog our hot wire, so okay. we'll we'll just build the next paddock, and then roll one up. And they it takes them a little while. Once they get used to the hot wire, they don't go anywhere. So it takes them a little yeah. while to get competent enough to go to the next paddock. <clears throat> you know, the grass is taller there. They know that it, there should have been a hot wire there, um, but it's not it's, really any different than moving cows or <clears throat> moving sheep. Not really. People have a tendency to want to grab the pig or push the pig. And they're strong. You know, <laughs> it, there's, there's no sense fighting with them. Um, it's been a little bit of a trick, like when it's market day, to get them loaded in a trailer. And I, so I took a little bit of thinking how to get them. Yeah. That's that Christy's idea too. She, why don't you just put a little feed in there for a day into the trailer? Yeah, yeah. And so I did that the first time I did it. I backed over the hot wire with my aluminum trailer, and then I built a ramp. Everything real sweet for these pigs to walk up. Just make it nice and easy for them. You know. And then there's about four that weren't going in there. Some walked right up the ramp, although well, then the ramp fell down. And some of these pigs didn't want nothing to do with getting close to that trailer. <laughs> so I'm grabbing a hole. I grab a hole of the trailer gate and trying to figure out what's going on. Well, the whole thing's hot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the wire's up underneath, and it's yeah. the, whole, the whole trailer's hot. So yeah, it took a little retraining on those ones to get them loaded. But I shut it off now. Yeah. That's good. You know, and you can build a, if you're careful, um, the first time we moved them, so we, we got the pigs real little, put them in a shed, and then we we were going to go quite a ways with them. So I just built a little alleyway out of hot wire, and then I took a couple electric fence posts and put string on them, and two of us, we got the pigs in the alleyway, and then two of us took that string, and then we could touch that hot wire along the way, and the whole thing was hot, and then you just you know, you're just asking them to move you're not telling them so as, as long as they move they're good and then you just slide the hot wire up a little bit behind them and they turn around and they get hit and you ask them to move again mm -hmm. i saw something on twitter the other day where someone was moving cows down the road by holding up a poly wire in a square and walking and they had like 40 cows and i'm not kidding you i'm not making it up because those cows were so used to the poly wire perimeter and, and, and they were like intensely the mob grade, so used to kind of be in close quarters. And they just literally walked down the road with the poly wire out, like holding one post, and moved the cows in there. I, I, I believe know. it. That's strange. Yeah, it worked. I believe it. We just like get them on the road, and then let them run, and then stretch out for like a mile and a half. And that too. Yep. And then so mm -hmm. it seemed then like it made more sense. Go back to the place and pick up all the cows with the horse trailer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh. It's nice to hear other people go through that. I think we owe it to ourselves to go down one more path yeah. before we wrap up. And and before we started the podcast, we talked about um, thinking ahead, right? Thinking n not the five, 10 year outlook of where we're at, but further, right, Jared? I mean, we're talking, what'd you say, a thousand years out? Well, I just kind of said, I've been going down weird rabbit trails lately thinking about like the far future and some books I'm reading and stuff. And it's, if you can read something that was written 2,500 years ago, scriptural text, Egyptian, you know, records, ancient Greece, the Bible, things like that, that are thousands of years old. Why wouldn't you think thousands of years out, right? Why would you, why would you think that his society has and civilization has a shorter time span going forward than we do even recorded history going back. And so look far out, right? Where do you want to be? I don't know, that's 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 my thinking. Right. So you know, let's not look a thousand years out, Sean. That's maybe a little too far. But Wednesday? I, How's Wednesday? Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think your comment surrounding the really one of the focuses, as you said it, for the operation now is to how to make this an appealing place for your children, right? Rather than than gonna you know, saying, oh, go get a, go get a job, go live a thousand miles away, go try and make a six figure salary, but you know, in your twenties and you know, 
how do you move away from that to say, we would like you here. We want you a part of our lives in the future. And Yeah. So when we, I, I kind of back up a little bit, but when we decided to go down, when we figured out soil health, we just, we had to sacrifice a little bit to do that. So we, we just said, whatever it takes to build soil, that's what we're going to do because we realized how important that was. And it's been about, you know, five years of really working at it and, and some sacrifice on our end to, to make that happen financially. It's been a bit of a sacrifice for us, but now we're starting to see that. So I think Alan Williams said, if you start to see the bugs and the birds and the wildlife come back, you're regenerating. And so you're seeing in those areas where we're, we're really focused and able to, to do those things we're seeing that like people are envious. They're driving by, well, how come you have 200 deer and you know, a quarter and you know, yeah. And 150 grouse and a hundred turkeys. And you know, there's everything's here and they're here for a reason. It isn't because it's good cover for them. They can go wherever it's, I think it's, uh, goes back to that. I don't know if it's nutrient dense or what, but there's health there. And I think those animals know it. So, um, kind of thinking out I you know if we want anybody to come back it doesn't have to be my kids if they're not interested and they have a good life and they want to do what they want to do that's great but some young person's going to want to do it and we're willing to help whoever that is and so that person's going to need a good foundation and so that's why I think it's so important for us just to keep focusing and, and sacrificing and, and you know, we're not unhappy, mm-hmm. you know, it, things are a little tight. We're driving older stuff, um, but we're not unhappy. I think we're happier than we've ever been. So. Yeah. I, I th- make the reference, I've probably done it in the podcast before, but make the reference that the ultimate goal of agriculture has always been, and, and not defined by farmers or defined by agriculture, but from a societal standpoint, is to have the fewest possible people engaged in creating food for everybody else to free other people up to do other things, to you know become artists, to invent, become inventors. And really, it's just, as countries advance, in order to ramp up manufacturing, the biggest factor was to be able to free up a lot of labor force to come in and work factories to make things to industrialize. And, and now we're, we're to a point where talking about universal basic income because there's like no jobs or nothing to do or, well, I mean, a job shortage now, but like looking even a generation out, we're like, like well, what if robots do everything for people in the cities and what are people actually going to do with their time? Um, and we might conceptually pay people to do nothing because there's nothing for them to do. And then you think, well, how backwards is this? And why wouldn't people invest time in nature, on a farm, on a ranch, you know, doing some of those slightly more labor intensive management things that are less input driven and be happier, be outside. So I, I, I think it's looking at it and saying we've, we, agriculture's re, kind of reached its apex to where we really can't contribute anymore to society by continually driving people out of rural areas. Well, now we need to keep them here and bring more in. Justin? <laughs> Well, that was pretty heavy. That's, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I think it, it brings in thoughts of, of what you said about just the disconnect of people. And we, I don't know, Jared and I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago about the, the circle of people finding themselves having to come back to agriculture because they know absolutely nothing about it. And so you're right, as our, as our I don't know, our, our businesses, our metropolises <laughs> find themselves out of actual physical work because there's not physical work for them man what else do you do right and it goes down to the basic things of living to eat and maybe that is the most basic of them all just having to live to eat i i just i it's it's strange that in rural america we're we're having to try and entice people here from a labor standpoint because rural areas were always a labor surplus and we were always exporting into the cities. And now the states that are the most rural in the rural areas have lower unemployment than the larger cities do. We've become an in, in inverse. Mm-hmm. And so when you look at it, I, I don't think a major premise for a lot of 
a lot of farms. And I know some that are active today will say that, but I don't think the, the premise for most farms and ranches in the last hundred years was let's, let's get our, let's get our kids back here. Let's, let's make sure that they come back. It's mm-hmm. more, we want them to be as successful and profitable as possible wherever it is. And, and for most people that was not here. I know the ones that are maybe still around talk like that, but we lost 80, 90% of our farmers and ranchers. So clearly yeah. everybody was leaving. Yeah. I think it, if you think about people sitting around and being paid to do nothing, there's, there's a, you know, a strive for happiness, no matter mm-hmm. what you're doing and try to go out in your garden and dig around in your hands and knees for a while and come back to the house and tell me that you don't feel something good mm-hmm. about what you just did. Right. Um, I don't know. I, it seems like there's a bigger disconnect. It's as there's a split between huge agriculture and people that want to know a little bit of everything and grow their own food and preserve their own food. And, you know, it's, uh, it just seems like there's like maybe more, I don't know if you call them homesteaders or whatever, mm-hmm. but there's more of those type of people that are interested in. And I think it's a good thing. What if you had, you know, if you had 5,000 acres and, 10 families living on it and those, you know, your little coffee shop was thriving and mm-hmm. you could go into town and have a piece of pie. And now all that stuff was bubbling, <laughs> you know, I right. can just see the whole thing. And I think that's part of regenerative agriculture. They're not regenerating just the soil They're It's the communities and the people. That's a great thought to think about. It's well said. Yep. Yep. The happiness. So I think that, that, Oh, that holds true, right? So how it builds happiness within your family, like you've talked about, builds happiness within communities. When we look at depression rates and, you know, just mm-hmm. that, I don't know, this is the degraded minds of people, of being automated with what they do and having to be so bored and doing nothing. Yeah. Getting back to the land is super powerful for them. It's really important. And even in the last ag census in 2017, you saw that split happening already. The the growth in the number of farms in the category was the the number of extremely large farms grew and the number of extremely farms small farms grew at the same time but the middle kind of like continued to degrade to kind of bottom out and I, I, there's probably some truth to it and there's really smart economists that study the the data more than than i, I do so i i don't want to say that i can argue with them on a fundamental level that they're incorrect but many times including yesterday i hear People advising, we pay speaking fees to people to come into agriculture and listen to, you know, tell farmers about how the bigger getting bigger, they're getting more efficient. In the future, 80% of the food is going to be produced by 70,000 farms. Like, it's kind of like a, a scare tactic to, like, do the things you were doing seven, eight years ago, right? Well, I got to expand. I better have 600 cows. And then once you get 600, then you better get to 900. And it's kind of like, what, what's the threat there? Because you, you can't really go bankrupt if you don't owe anybody money. You know, so like you can, if you can get to a point where you are comfortable and safe, I, I don't know why you would continue to listen to people. If you can retain a profit and you're solvent and you're paying down debt or, you know, manage that. I don't know why you'd listen to some expert tell you that you're not going to be in business. Yeah, that's an excellent point. You think about our, the homesteaders we had here before, they lived off the land mm-hmm. and they were happy. And mm-hmm. it wasn't until they had to go borrow money for something that they lost the place or mm-hmm. gave up or whatever. But yeah, I don't know. I, I, I still, I'm still stuck in my last statement where I'm visualizing all these people out on the land, mm-hmm. you know, happily working in harmony with the land and nature. And um, I think we had this question at the soil health conference, somebody we were talking about depression and Justin, you mentioned depression and sitting around. It's, it's pretty easy to get depressed. I mean, a lot of people, with COVID sat on the couch for two weeks and Mm -hmm. you don't feel good about yourself or anything you've accomplished. So anyway, out here in Western South Dakota ranch, and we have a lot of neighboring, you know, a lot of neighbors still. So if we're going to do something with cattle, we call the neighbors, neighbors come over. We're all working together. They need something done. You know, we go help them. There's a branding or whatever. Neighbors help neighbors spring and fall and sometimes through the summer and winter. But um, if you think about those huge, those huge farms, if they were broke up into, you know, littler deals and those people would start, you could just see that whole community building or I can anyway, sitting here talking about it. But 
Um, not saying it needs to be a forceful thing. I'm just saying that community mm-hmm. is pretty awesome to mm-hmm. combat depression. I think when uh, our goal, uh, the goal in farming and ranching, I think goal for most people is to become independent, right? Independent um, and, and not have to have someone overlord and, and tell you what you can or can't do and be able to be self-sufficient and that kind of stuff. And that's kind of what we think about independence. But really interdependence, right, which is that neighborliness is is really important to our health. Uh, it's, it's, it's not measured in a, a financial metric when it comes to independence, that kind of stuff. But being able to rely on people and know that you're relied on is an extreme extremely part important part of a healthy psyche and that's that's where we talk about building that community and that network of of neighbors and ranchers that get together for branding or get together for shipping and or help people out from here and there um i know we've done a little bit less of that over time in most places um but it's really it's really nice to get back to it we made a big circle yeah we did a really big circle but it's, it's actually the circle came back to what you one of the first comments you made was, man, we we made this change because we weren't happy, and now you are. You said you're the, probably the happiest you've been. So it's fantastic that we made that circle and talked through the dynamics of how it had to happen. I guess. Cool. Thank you, Sean. We very much. This has been awesome. It's gonna be a great podcast. The sun's setting. We still have sheep to unload. Oh, yeah. we, be- <laughs> we better get to it. It's been a pleasure. We can fill that topper awesome. full of turkeys. <laughs> I'll trade sheep for turkeys. All in the east. <laughs> you got any pumpkins left? <laughs> yes. Very good. All right. Thanks again. We appreciate it. Yep. No, it was great, you guys. Thanks for having me. You betcha.